Hi there, we are two math students from the UK and this is our last minute attempt of an entry to the 3 blue 1 brown the summer of math exposition. We'd like to warn you that this is a last minute entry and may contain some inaccuracies, glossings over, errors and a roller coaster of a compact orientable cipher surface. A knot is a closed loop in 3D space, like the result of tying a knot in a string, then connecting the ends together so it cannot be undone by moving the ends around. In knot theory, we only care about the structure of the knot, not the way in which it is embedded into space, so we are free to move parts of the knot around. We consider two knots to be the same if one can be continuously deformed into the other. The simplest knot we could consider is the unknot, which is just a closed loop that has not been knotted, in other words, a circle. Another example of a knot is the trefoil, which looks like this. We can represent this knot as a diagram with gaps indicating under crossings. We still have to show that this trefoil knot is different to the unknot, which may seem obvious from the diagram, but in general it is difficult to distinguish between lots of pairs of knots, which is where the tools of knot theory come in. We'd like to find invariants for knots that don't depend on how the knot is drawn or manipulated in space. We'd next like to think about how we can combine knots to make new knots. The obvious way to do this is just to break the string of each knot, then join the ends together. We call the result of this operation the connected sum of the knots. This sum doesn't depend on where we join the knots together. What happens if we take the connected sum of any knot with the unknot? We can see in this diagram that we just add a loop and this does not affect the knot. So we have that any knot added to the unknot gives the knot back. More interestingly, we can add trefoil knots together. This gives us a granny knot or a square knot depending on the relative orientation of the trefoils as depicted here. It's easy to see that the connected sum is associative, since the order of joining the knots together doesn't affect the resulting knot. The connected sum is also commutative, since the definition doesn't distinguish between the two knots involved. If we want to reverse this operation, we can just consider the two pieces of string between the knots. If we place a sphere that intersects these, but doesn't intersect the rest of the knot, then we can rejoin these split ends along the sphere to give the two original knots. We call this factoring a knot into a connected sum of two other knots. In the integers, the prime numbers are those such that if we write p as a product, p is a, b, then we must have 1 of a and b equal to 1. This is to say that p has no factors. In a similar way, we can think about prime knots, knots that can't be factored into a connected sum of knots. If we compare to the definition of a prime number in the integers, we didn't need a not k such that if we write k equals j plus l, then 1 of j and l is the unknot. We'd like to find another similarity to the integers in trying to factorise any knot into a product of prime knots, which would then simplify the study of knots. We would only have to consider the prime knots and the ways they can join together. First, we'd like to find some examples of prime knots. Consider the trefoil knot. What if we could deform the trefoil knot until we have two trefoil knots sitting next to each other, then chop them in half? Then the trefoil would not be prime, since it could be written as a connected sum of two non-trivial knots, and we wouldn't be able to factorise the trefoil, since we could keep repeating this process. The trefoil is in fact a prime knot, we can see this by drawing the trefoil onto a torus. Then consider any knot on the surface of a torus. We can flatten out the torus to a rectangle with opposite sides identified. We can then straighten out all the lines. This doesn't affect the knot. Then consider how a sphere could intersect with the torus to factor it into a sum of two knots. This will be either a pair of horizontal lines or vertical lines on the rectangle or a circle. Either the knot is split up into more than two components, or one of the components is a line segment, so an unknot. This implies that any knot drawn on a torus is prime, and therefore that the trefoil knot is prime. 
we now need to consider some more properties of a knot to get closer to proving prime factorization. A powerful invariant is the genus of a knot, which relates to the surfaces of which the knot is the boundary. We saw earlier with torus knots that considering the surfaces related to the knot could be helpful for proving things about them. To get to the genus, we need to introduce the idea of a cipher surface. This is a surface of which the knot is a boundary. For example, the unknot is the boundary of a disk, so the disk is a cipher surface of the unknot. We can in fact construct a cipher surface for any knot using Seifert's algorithm. This involves redrawing a knot's diagram as some concentric circles with the crossings marked on. Then replace the circles with disks at different heights above the paper and connect the crossings with a half-twisted band. We then compactify the surface, which is to complete it into a surface that doesn't have a boundary, like a sphere or a torus. Then we can count the holes in the compactified Seifert surface to get its genus. Then we can define the genus as the minimal genus of a Seifert surface of the unknot. The only knot with genus zero is the unknot. The compactified disk is a ball, which has genus zero, and a knot drawn on a ball separates it into two disks. We'd like to show that the genus is additive when we take the connected sum of two knots, that the genus of j connected to k equals the genus of j plus the genus of k. For example, once we've proven that the genus is additive, we have an easy proof that knots of genus 1 are prime. Since the only knot that has genus 0 is the unknot, and genus is otherwise positive, if the genus of k equals 1, and the genus of k also equals the sum of the genuses of L and J, then either the genus of L or the genus of J is zero. So is the unknot, which implies that k is prime. We have that the genus of the trefoil is one, so we have again proved that the trefoil knot is prime. To prove that the genus is additive, it is helpful to first think about the Euler characteristics of two surfaces and their connected sum. This may seem at first unrelated, but it can give a somewhat easier approach to thinking about how this property changes when the two surfaces are connected. Once we find this, we can relate the Euler characteristic of a surface to its genus, and hence find an expression for the genus of a connected sum of two surfaces. First, recall that the Euler characteristic of a surface is the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces on a triangulation of the surface. Each triangle is a face, and each edge is shared by at most two triangles. For example, the sphere can be triangulated as shown, giving six vertices, 12 edges, and eight faces, giving an Euler characteristic of two. To calculate the Euler characteristic of the connected sum of two surfaces, we can use the triangulation to our advantage. The connected sum of two surfaces is formed by removing a disk from each of the surfaces and connecting them at the boundaries of the removed disks, similarly to how the connected sum of knots works. When connecting our surfaces, we first triangulate them and then remove a triangle instead of a disk from each. When these triangulated surfaces are then connected, the connected sum is also a triangulated surface. In the process, three vertices and three edges are lost from being merged, and two faces are lost from when they're removed. Therefore, we can say that if the Euler characteristic of one surface and the Euler characteristic of another surface, then the connected sum has the sum of the Euler characteristics minus two. Now, how do we use this result to relate the Euler characteristic of the surface to the genus? Induction on the genus, starting with genus zero, a sphere. We know that the Euler characteristic of a sphere is two, a torus has genus 1, so our inductive step is to form the connected sum of a surface and a torus to increase the genus by 1, because the number of holes increases by 1. A torus has Euler characteristic 2 minus 4 plus 2 equals 0. Therefore, when we form the connected sum of a torus and a surface S, then the Euler characteristic is the Euler characteristic plus that of the torus minus 2. That is to say, the Euler characteristic of the original surface minus 2. Adding a torus increases the genus by 1 and decreases the Euler characteristic by 2. Hence, the Euler characteristic of a surface is 2 minus 2 times the genus, 
so the genus is 1 minus half the Euler characteristic. Now let's apply these results to the genus of a connected sum. Let knots J and K have genuses G and H respectively. Suppose we have a triangulation of their minimal cipher surfaces SJ and SK. Then we know the Euler characteristics in terms of G and H, and that when we connect the minimal cipher surfaces together, we get a cipher surface for the connected sum of J and K, which we know the Euler characteristic of, and therefore know the genus of. We don't, however, know that this joined cipher surface is the minimal possible surface, so the true genus of the connected sum of J and K could be smaller, and we get that the genus of J plus the genus of K is greater than or equal to the genus of the connected sum of J and K. Now we just need to establish the other inequality to establish the result. This involves going the other way and considering factoring a knot. If we have a minimal cipher surface of the connected sum of J and K, then we can consider a sphere that factorizes the knot, splitting this cipher surface into two parts, then triangulate and work things out similarly to before. This gives us that the genus of J plus the genus of K is less than or equal to the genus of the connected sum. We have therefore shown both inequalities, so we get that the genus of the connected sum is the sum of the genuses. We can now show lots of nice results about knots. For example, knots don't cancel each other. Suppose they did, then we could write that J plus K equals the unknot, but then taking the genus we find that J and K must have genus zero, so must also be unknots. Now we can get to the main result. Knots can be factored into prime knots. Start with a knot K of genus N. Either K can be written as a connected sum of non-trivial knots, or K is prime. If K is prime, we are done. Else we can split K into two knots of a smaller genus, and we can repeat this recursively, keep splitting the smaller knots into pieces until they are all prime. They must eventually be prime, since the sum of all the genuses is n, and the smallest genus a knot can have is 1. It turns out that the decomposition into prime knots is in fact unique, and this can be seen using the techniques built up in this video. See the paper in the description for a further explanation. For now, we leave you with a roller coaster around a trefoil knot, courtesy of Seifert View, a project by Jack Van Vyck. Thanks for watching.